Hi, I'm Chris. I'm the composer of Hitler Havoc. I'd like to give a short introduction to the work that you're about to hear. Um, I'm not going to explain everything that the piece means to me, but I'll give a, a brief outline of some of the things included in the work. And like the composer Rachmaninoff said, um, I do not believe in the artist that discloses too much of his images. Let the listener paint for themselves what it most suggests. So this composition is a reflection on my own beliefs, as well as uh, exploration out into other faith traditions. Hitler Havot is an old Jewish word meaning inner fire, and it denotes the spiritual fervor experienced in worship and prayer, which originates from Hasidic Judaism. You may also notice the famous Dias Era chant dotted throughout the work, which means day of wrath or day of judgment. I've also included the artwork of Gustave Doré of Jacob wrestling the angel of Yahweh to illustrate some of the themes included in the work, as wrestling with God is an integral part of what it means to me to believe. Um, the recording you're about to hear was rehearsed and recorded in the space of one hour with the RNCM Year One String Orchestra, which is, is to my mind, an amazing achievement for everybody involved in the recording. And I'm so happy to get to share that with you now. So I, I hope you enjoy.
As we gather to worship, so let us pray. Go before us, O Lord, in this and all our doings, with thy most gracious favour, and further us with thy continual help, that in all our work, begun, continued and ended in thee, we may glorify thy holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The choir prayer. Bless, O Lord, us, your servants who minister in this place. Grant that what we have said and sung with our lips we may believe in our hearts, and what we believe in our hearts we may show forth in our daily lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good evening and a very warm welcome to Blackburn Cathedral Online for our service of choral evensong, sung for us this evening by Vox Ex Animo, a choir founded and directed by Harvey Stansfield, a previous organ scholar here at Blackburn Cathedral. O Lord, open thou our lips. And the voices of all thy prayers. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is 
First hymn this evening is All My Hope on God is Founded. Stiff neck, 
first book of Kings, beginning to read at verse 11. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon. Concerning this house that you are building, if you will walk in my ways, obey my ordinances, and keep all my commandments by walking in them, then I will establish my promise with you, which I made to your father David. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. So Solomon built the house and finished it. In the inner sanctuary he made two cherubim of olive wood, each ten cubits high. Five cubits were the length of one wing of the cherub and five cubits the length of the other wing of the cherub. It was ten cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. The other cherub also measured ten cubits. Both cherubim had the same measure and the same form. The height of one cherub was ten cubits and so was that of the other. He put the cherubim in the innermost part of the house. The wings of the cherubim were spread out so that the wing of one was touching one wall and the wing of the other cherub was touching the other wall. Their other wings toward the centre of the house were touching wing to wing. He also overlaid the cherubim with gold. He carved the wall of the house all around about with carved engravings of cherubim palm trees and open flowers in the inner and outer rooms. The floor of the house he overlaid with gold in the inner and outer rooms. For the entrance to the inner sanctuary he made doors of olive wood. The lintel and the doorposts were five-sided. He covered the two doors of olive wood with carvings of cherubim, palm trees and open flowers. He overlaid them with gold and spread gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. He also made the entrance to the nave doorposts of olive wood, each four-sided and two doors of cypress wood. The two leaves of one door were folding and the two leaves of the other door were folding. He carved cherubim palm trees and open flowers, overlaying them with gold evenly applied upon the carved work. 
he built the inner court with three courses of dressed stone and one course of cedar beams. In the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid, in the month of Ziv. In the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished in all its parts and according to all its specifications. He was seven years in building it. Here ends the reading. reading from the twelfth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. About that time, King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. He had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. After he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the festival of unleavened bread. 
When he had seized him, he put him in prison and handed him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. While Peter was kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. The very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while guards in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his wrists. The angel said to him, Fasten your belt and put on your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter went out and followed him. He did not realise that what was happening with the angel's help was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. After they had passed the first and the second guard, they came before the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord and they went outside and walked along a lane when suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. As soon as he realised this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many had gathered and were praying. When he knocked at the outer gate, a maid named Rhoda came to answer. On recognising Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the gate, she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she insisted that it was so. They said, it is his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking and when they opened the gate, they saw him and were amazed. He motioned to them with his hand to be silent and described for them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he added, tell this to James and to the believers. Then he left and went to another place. Here ends the reading.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with my spirit. Let us pray. in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and of thy great mercy keep us in the same, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, Give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee 
we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mozart composed Ave Verum Corpus in 1791, and he scored it for strings and organ and choir. And uh, he wrote it for the Feast of Corpus Christi, the Body of Christ. Now, not many people realize that the 14th century poem in Latin actually rhymes. So you have words like natum, rhyming with immolatum, perforatum, preustatum, and virgine, homine, sanguine, and examine. Now those words in English would be hail true body born of the Virgin Mary having truly suffered and sacrificed on the cross for mankind from whose pierced side flowed water and blood. Be for us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in the trial of our death. It's also noteworthy that Mozart did not set the final words of that poem, which were, O oh Jesus, Son of Mary, have mercy on me. Instead, he repeated his own last line in the trial of our death, for six months later, he also died. Now, most of us know that Mozart used to write in four-bar phrases, especially in his concertos and symphonies. In other words, if you hear the, uh, the first four bars, you can make a pretty good guess at what's coming next. But that is not true of this gem of choral music, for although Mozart did write it in four-bar phrases, you can't tell what's coming next. Instead, Mozart creates an exquisite stream of choral delights when he weaves phrase after phrase of sacred melodies and harmonies in various keys which bless all who sing them and also bless all who hear them. So here is Mozart's Ave Verum Corpus Hail, true body, born of the Virgin Mary.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Part of my ministry as Bishop of Burnley takes me to the different prisons around the diocese. And often when I'm in prison, chatting to prisoners, I ask myself the same question. What if I were in prison, I think? Supposing I were serving a life sentence, spent 15, 20 years inside. What, I wonder, what is the first thing I would do on being released? Imagine 20 years in which every night I've been slammed, locked into a cell. Suddenly, I'm outside of the prison. I'm in the world. What would I do first? Would I perhaps go to McDonald's and have a Big Mac? Would I go and see my mum and my family for hugs all round? Would I go to a pub for a pint of beer? Would I perhaps just lie down on the grass, gazing up into the sky, rejoicing in nature all around me? What's the first thing I would do when I was set free? What about you, I wonder? Supposing you were in prison, you were released, what's the first thing you would do? That's what we see with St Peter in the second reading from the Acts of the Apostles that we listen to today. Herod has decided to persecute the Christians and it seems to please the crowd, so he carries on, he arrests Peter and bangs Peter up in jail. But while Peter is in prison, the church carries on praying. And as we know, when we pray, things happen. And because of the prayers of the church, Peter is remarkably, miraculously set free. An angel appears, the doors are thrown open, Peter can taste freedom once again. So, once set free from prison, what is the first thing that Peter does? Well, the first thing is, he goes to the community. He goes back to the church. He goes to the people who've been praying for him. Now, it's not a very easy return. For some bizarre reason, the person on the door doesn't recognise him. He's kept locked outside. Doubtless the Christians inside are frightened because of this persecution going on. So it's a weird return, but Peter's determined. Eventually the doors are thrown open. Peter can rejoice with the community in what God has done. So the first thing he does is he goes back to the church. But then the second thing is, restored by being with the church, Peter goes into the world. He's strengthened through this experience for a remarkable ministry of proclaiming the freedom we find in Christ. A freedom that is so much richer than just escaping from prison. It's freedom from sin, freedom from death, freedom to be the people Jesus calls us to be. That's the freedom Peter spends the rest of his life proclaiming. So when he gets out of prison, Peter goes to the community, then he goes out into the world. Now, in a strange sort of way, we're experiencing steady, slow freedom at the moment. A few weeks ago, we were in deepest lockdown. We could barely get out of our houses. We couldn't mix with our friends. Everything was closed. Bit by bit, though, freedom is returning. We can visit neighbours and family if we do so carefully. Our churches are slowly reopening again for worship. We can go out for meals. We can go swimming and go to the gym and so on and so forth. It's going to be a tough road. There'll be setbacks along the way, maybe more local lockdowns. We pray not, but that kind of thing may happen. But slowly, we're experiencing freedom again. So what will we do as we're steadily set free? Well, I think Peter can show us the way. First of all, we need to return to the community. In other words, we need to return to our local churches. That return may not be easy. In churches these days, there's a lot of social distancing, people have to wear face masks. That's why we're still broadcasting services like we are today. And of course, for singers and choirs, that's really sad. They're not yet able to sing together. So just like Peter banging on the door, it'll be a slow return to our churches, but a critical one. Because you know, the local church is the hope of the world. It's the hope of the world because it equips and sends Christians to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Lockdown has been tough for our churches, building shut, income collapsing. So the first thing we need to do with freedom is go back to our communities and rebuild our local churches. But then as we do that, again, just like Peter, 
we can do the second thing, which is to go out into the world, out to proclaim a message of freedom. People long to be free, but actually, so often the freedom people grasp after is fake, or it's short-lived, or it's dependent on money or health. In Christ, we find a far, far richer freedom than that. Because Jesus, through his dying, has set us free to live with him forever. In Jesus, we find an eternal freedom, a freedom that begins the moment we let him into our lives, a freedom that endures for all eternity. That's the freedom people really long for. So we rejoice in our freedom from lockdown, but may this freedom point to the far deeper freedom we find in Christ. Let's go back and rebuild our churches and then sent by our local churches, let's go into the world to proclaim the true freedom of the children of God. Amen. And so now we're going to turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has taught us to make prayers and intercessions for all people, we pray for ministers of religion and all who guide the thoughts of the people, for artists, authors, musicians and journalists, that our common life may be crowned with truth and beauty, for all who heal the body, guard the health of the people and tend the sick, that they may follow in the footsteps of Christ, the great physician. For all on whose labour we depend for the necessities of life, for those who carry on the commerce of the world, that they may seek no private gain which would hinder the good of all. For parents and children, 
that purity, love and honour may dwell in our homes, and duty and affection may be the bond of our family life. For all who draw nigh unto death, that they may know thy presence with them through the valley of the shadow, and may wake to behold thy face through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, at your Last Supper you prayed to the Father that all should be one. Send your Holy Spirit upon all who bear your name and seek to serve your Church. Strengthen our faith in you and lead us to love one another in humility. In this Diocese of Blackburn we rejoice in our links with the Anglican Communion throughout the world and in particular in our links with the Free State and Brandschweig. May we who have been reborn in one baptism be united in one faith under one shepherd. Amen. We pray for our cathedral, our bishops and all who serve across our diocese. God of time and eternity, we thank you that this and all our times are in your hands. Rejoicing in your faithfulness, we celebrate the life of our diocese in stories of faith and hope, in worship offered, disciples gathered and communities transformed by your reconciling love. As we give you thanks and praise, give us your vision. Help us to walk your way and pour upon us those gifts we need to work with you, that, filled with your spirit, your church may serve you here with strength and joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office, that they may work for the common good. O Lord, you have taught us that the world is yours and those who dwell on it. Hear us, therefore, as we pray for the life of the world, that every nation may seek the way that leads to peace, that human rights and freedom may everywhere be respected, and that the earth's resources may be ungrudgingly shared among all. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And so we turn to the Lord, our hearts full of anxiety, worry, and concern for ourselves, our families, and our neighbors, praying that we may know the peace and the ways in which we convert our distress into acts of kindness and care for our neighbors, just as these things have been showered upon us. We pray, too, for peace among the nations, between the mighty and the powerful, and among the desperately poor, as they strive with the most meager of resources to combat the world pandemic. And so we continue to pray for those caught up in the violence of war, now submerged beneath the headlines, but suffering doubly, for peacemakers and peacekeepers who seek to keep this world secure and free. For all who bear the burden and privilege of leadership, political, military, religious, in hospitals, social care, and in medical research, asking for gifts of wisdom and resolve in the search for peace and well-being in every part of the world. O God of truth and justice, we hold before you those whose memory we cherish and whose names we will never know. Help us to lift our eyes above the distress of this broken world and grant us the grace to sustain our prayers for all those communities where fear, where fear stalks the land. We ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, who gave the universe its melody and placed rhythm into our hearts, Bless Fox X Animal and all who work to give a glimpse of the harmonies of heaven to the people of our earth. Lord.
Lord, may our ears be ever open to the prompting of your Spirit. May our eyes be ever open to the beauty of your world. May our voices dress your church with songs of light and life in their never-ending hymn of praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty and loving God, thank you that you bestow upon us the gifts of compassion and grace. We hold before you all who use this compassion in their work with the very young and the very old. We ask that you would give them patience and grace when their work is challenging and complicated and that you would refresh them when their work is tiring. We also pray for all who work in schools, colleges and universities. We know that the past few months have brought many new difficulties to their working lives. We ask that you would help them to achieve good and restorative rest during any summer break they manage to enjoy. And that you would keep alive in them the passion to share their knowledge and encourage all who desire to learn. We ask this through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Gracious God, we give thanks for all those who work on the front line during this pandemic, particularly those who work for the National Health Service and in social care. Give skill, empathy and resilience to all who are caring for the sick, and your wisdom to those searching for ways to limit the virus. Strengthen with your spirit all who care for others. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for those who need the assurance of your love, in particular those who are sick in body, mind or spirit and for those who watch with them. In the quietness of our hearts, we pray for those who are on our minds this day and ask that you would bless and protect them through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We commend to your everlasting mercy and care all those who have died especially those who have died recently, those dying because of COVID-19, and all whose memory we cherish. May the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord, to make our common supplication unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient to them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, dwell with us and be our welcome guest. Bring your joy to our homes this evening, and in our rest, grant us your peace. May we know your presence with us in our prayers and in our play, in our tears and in our laughter, this night and for evermore. Amen. O Lord, support us all the day long of this troublous life, until the shades lengthen and the evening comes. The busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. The final hymn this evening, 
The day thou gavest, Lord, is ended. So that concludes our Evensong. Before the blessing, I'd like to say a great big thank you. Thank you to our choir, Vox Ex Animo, and for Harvey Stansfield, the musical director. In this time when choirs are unable to sing live, it's been a real delight to join in Evensong and delight in their beautiful hymns of praise and the music they've offered for us. Thank you to all those who joined in with this service, who've read, who've prayed, who've shared in any way. And thank you above all to you, for joining us for this Evensong. Uh, we end with our prayers for you and for your families and for all the people you love. And let's ask God for his blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this night and always.